All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar about how two Midwest communities have worked hard to build cross-sector coalitions that not only create jobs in communities hardest hit by poverty and historic divestment, but also work to protect children from childhood-led poisoning. Uh, as you all may know, there is no safe level of lead exposure. And even at low levels, damage can happen to a child's developing brain and cause lifelong, often irreversible problems affecting education, behavior, and health. And while this is a very avoidable and solvable problem, we find that communities of color and low-income communities often bear the brunt of what it means to be lead poisoned. Now, there has been significant federal legislation and rules on leaded gasoline, lead paint, and lead in water that has uh, significantly reduced lead exposure rates over the past 50 years. And the presence of lead paint and lead pipes in older housing continues to threaten the health and well-being of all communities. What's most interesting is that we are wasting a ton of resources by acting only when disaster strikes. When we wait for kids to get poisoned, in order to abate homes, or when we wait for water mains to break in order to replace lead pipes, that reactive response results in an inefficient use of public dollars. Because we know when our kids become lead poisoned, that results in millions spent on healthcare costs. And because of mental and physical issues, we know that doctor visits costs, insurance costs. We know that lead poisoning results in dollars spent on special education and parental work loss because it gets hard for parents to work a full-time job and take care of a child impacted by lead poisoning. My home state of Wisconsin reports that if childhood lead poisoning in Wisconsin were completely eliminated, the state would save $7 billion in costs for medical treatments, special education, and crime and juvenile delinquency. Wisconsin also reports that there would be an estimated 21 billion in new earnings because of increased high school graduation rates and increased lifetime ability to earn and work a full-time job. Research shows that for every dollar spent proactively lead abating homes before a child is poisoned, there would be a 17 to one return on investment. Recently, Natural Resources Defense Council conducted an analysis with Harvard Chan of public health and determine that benefits of removing lead pipes far outweigh the cost and the health benefits from replacing it, every lead water pipe in the country would save nearly $1 trillion from avoided health impacts. Saving children from childhood lead poisoning is possible and making sure all communities can drink clean water and can live in a healthy home is a reality. We are at a very special moment in time with the resources flowing from the federal government. The White House's Lead Pipe and Paint Action Plan is a great start to investing in protecting families from lead poisoning. The plan includes over 15 new actions from more than 10 federal agencies to ensure resources are allocated to make progress towards fighting lead poisoning over the next decade. The White House has led the way to push out a ton of resources. We have seen a historic investment in $15 billion in lead service line replacement. We've seen $403 million to state and local governments for improving health and safety in privately owned homes of low-income families under HUD's Lead Hazard Reduction Grant Program. We've seen an additional $165 million in grants to public housing agencies for improving health and public housing probably the largest health and safety investment to date for public housing. And while these are uh, added benefit and a ton of great resources, these are only temporary resources to fix a centuries old problem. No community has been able to solve lead issues solely with federal dollars. And it will take some real collaboration between elected officials public sector workers, labor unions, frontline community groups, and funders to figure out how we can translate the federal momentum into tangible results for local communities. Local health departments and water utilities alike struggle to obtain the resources necessary to respond to lead poisoning cases and successfully repa replace every lead pipe. While federal resources are flowing into states and local communities to combat lead poisoning, 
there is still a learning curve that is needed within the public sector to best understand how to use these additional resources, how to bid out large volumes of work and how to attract a contractor base big enough to meet the demand for work, removing lead from our environment. And this is all while labor unions and contractors are waiting for public sectors uh, to make more work available so they are able to train and employ more apprentices. Uh, while we have some much needed resources, we have some big challenges that still need to be addressed if we hope to protect more children. And that's why I'm so excited today to dive into our discussion with our panelists to discuss their hard work. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'm now realizing I didn't introduce myself, but <laughs> my name is Richard Diaz. I am the Water Infrastructure Organizer at the Blue Green Alliance. And this event is brought to you today in partnership with our friends at Healthy Babies, Bright Future, and my good colleague, Kyra Numoff Shields. So uh, now I'll take some time to introduce our speakers. And I, I also wanna mention that um, I welcome you all in the audience to put your name and title in the chat. Uh, and if you already know, or as questions arise throughout the course of our discussion, please drop your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. All right. Here today, we have three leaders from across the Midwest to share their story of how they are fighting against childhood lead poisoning. These three innovative leaders have utilized a coalition model to create jobs for women, BIPOC communities, and to protect children from childhood lead poisoning. Today, we have Miss Alicia Smith. Alicia is the executive director of the Junction Coalition an organization dedicated to creating a vision and opportunity in Toledo, Ohio. She is the proud mother of three. There's Alicia. Hi, Hi Alicia. One. Hi. All right, next we have Miss Deanna Branch from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Deanna is the advocacy organizer for Cole's Lead Safe and Healthy Homes Project. She authored the children's book, Aiden, the lead-free superhero. Uh, she is the mother of two children who have been severely impacted by lead and an avid fighter in the, in the uh, battle against childhood lead poisoning. Uh, let's spotlight Deanna. Hello, Deanna. Hi, everyone. How are you? I am good. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, we have Mr. Kevin Kane from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Kevin is a, the chief economist and co-founder of Green Home Owners United a women-owned residential union construction company. Uh, oh, Kevin right. works with lenders, realtors, and homeowners to navigate and understand the benefits of green homes and has worked over a decade as a community organizer and a policy advocate. Let's welcome Kevin. Hi, everyone. All right, uh, now we have some prompts to get the discussion started today. Uh, our first question is going to be around coalition building. So panelists, how would you describe your coalition, including why it's right for your community? Uh, let's start with Alicia. Thank you. So I would describe the Junction Coalition based in four pillars of justice, environmental, economic, social justice, and peace education. The coalition is built with partners such as public health sector, individuals such as Nationwide Children's Hospital, a, a number of attorneys, public officials, uh, folks from the Toledo Lead Poisoning Coalition, as well as our public utilities and our trade unions, such as partners for individuals in labor, labor unions, um, the Coalition for Black Trade Unions, a number of individuals help to make up this coalition. And we all have to ask ourselves, what is our self-interest? The self-interest is our children. What is it that they all need to know? What do our parents need to know to protect those children who will one day be taking care of us? And so the coalition has to have a defined common unity, community to be able to move forward on. And that common unity is our children and it is the health 
public health, because we're the public in public health. And so it is our trade unions. It is our schools. We have a great partnership with Toledo Public Schools. We have great partnerships with our community action organizations and our juvenile court system, because we all know that lead is a cognitive disability inhabitor. And so with that, many of our children are shuffled into the school to prison pipeline. And so we have partnerships with all of those spaces to begin to do the reform, the mediation, prevention, and intervention. Thank you. Next, let's go to Ms. Deanna Branch to talk about the coalition model for her community. Deanna? Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon, everyone. The Coalition of Lady Mercy, also known as CO, was formed back in 2018 in response to the lack of urgency to protect children from childhood lead poisoning within the city of Milwaukee. I myself did not know lead exposure was an issue until I was personally impacted. I faced the reality of how serious things were when my son Aiden was hospitalized not once, but twice due to lead poisoning. The lead poisoning in his system gave him one set of health problems like ADHD, ODD, and other emotional issues. Secondary to the health issues of my son are the issues I have had with the landlords. When Aiden was first poisoned, the landlord replaced just the windows. When we returned home, Aiden became ill a second time. Following the second lead poison hospitalization, we found that there was lead in the water and within the walls of my apartment. My son Aiden gave me the strength and courage to speak out and use my voice to turn my anger at the injustice in my community into advocacy. That is the Coalition on Lady Emergency today. Situations like mine are why the Coalition on Lady Emergency was formed. COAL is a grassroots volunteer-led organization that seeks to uplift the voices and build the community, organizing capacity of those directly impacted to protect children from childhood lead poisoning. As a volunteer-led coalition, we have been able to work with the mayor to better resource our health department to lower the blood lead reference level for health investigations, work with the governor to allocate money in the budget to establish the lead safe homes program that allows for property owners to receive abatement services without a child testing for an elevated blood lead level, work with our health department to establish a public private partnership with our hospital systems to give mothers giving birth in the most impacted zip codes a kit that contains a water filter, education about lead, and case management support around lead exposure prevention. In partnership with our local workforce investment board to create a workforce development program that funds the training of lead pay abatement workers. There's more. Working with the state of Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to improve its definition of disadvantaged communities. Working with Milwaukee Waterworks to create an equity driven lead service line program that seeks to eliminate cost share for any out of pocket costs for rate payers. Working with members of the Common Council to pass an ordinance that gives renters protection and allows landlords to put the cost of lead paint abatement services on their property taxes. All of these achievements mentioned wouldn't be possible without the stories of impacted families, meeting with lawmakers to share the horrible tragedies of going through what I went through. Let impacted families tirelessly prioritizing showing up to city and state budget hearings and bringing others with them. This wouldn't be possible without impacted families being motivated to show up in numbers. And while we have been incredibly effective and advocacy as volunteers. In 2022, we made the decision to take our organizing to the next level. We established a nonprofit called the Coal Less Safe and Healthy Homes Project. Our mission is to build the capacity of those directly impacted because in our city, like in many predominantly black communities across the country, the communities that are most impacted by lead poisoning 
are the same communities that have been redlined or have the most renters or have the most out-of-state landlords. The state of Wisconsin DHS reports that for children, lead exposure is more of a poor school performance indicator than poverty or class size. DHS also reports that as adults, these children are 50% more likely to be arrested for violent crime for every five micrograms per deciliter of elevated blood lead level. The population who is most impacted is whose story we want to lift up and work with. And again, why in 2022, we founded our 501c3, the Cold Lead Safe and Healthy Homes Project, in which I serve as the advocacy organizer. Our organization is rooted in the community engagement. We have a community outreach program that seeks to knock on every door in our target area. Right now, we are currently working on delivering door-to-door -door education in home cleaning demonstrations, lab free kits, and are in the works of adding more components to our program. We are partnering with our local hospitals to develop capillary testing opportunities and also working to do dust sample collection because we know that dust is a huge issue when it comes to lab poisoning. We also have a community organizing program that utilizes relational organizing to build trust within the community members and find out what it's like going through experiences. We also seek to create a feedback loop between families who have experienced poisoning and service providers. Our ultimate goal is to create an army and build a base of impacted parents that can advocate for policy change. Program efficiencies and a fully funded ecosystem that supports our public sector and supports families to avoid lead poisoning. If an organization like Cole Lead Safe and Healthy Homes Project had been in place and a community outreach worker had visited my house, our lives would not have been turned upside down due to lead poisoning. And we are committed to improving our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Wow. Wow. Thank you for, for all your hard work and, and your, your dedication to saving other children. So thank you again. All right, our next question for our discussion uh, is, how have you integrated job training into your work? Uh, let's go to uh, Kevin to touch on this question. How have you integrated job training into your work and in, within your coalition? Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Kevin Kane, Green Homeowners United, uh, Chief Economist over here. Uh, we are a residential energy efficiency firm that uh, has union workers, members of laborers, uh, local 113 here in Greater Milwaukee. Uh, well, we are predominantly a residential energy efficiency firm doing things like insulation and windows and ceiling air leaks. Uh, we have been asked by the city of Milwaukee to start being more active in uh, lead abatement work and in joining the coalition uh, to be more involved. However, union workers often don't do residential projects outside of, of uh, certain areas like plumbing and electrician, but for home improvements generally, it's often not a union piece. Uh, and so what we need to figure out how to do is reconcile the difference between this big need of work that needs to be done in these homes with the kind of uh, training and workers that we want to make sure to have in this area. Um, again, most of our workers didn't come out of lead. Uh, and so we wanted to figure out how to train them. That's predominantly been done on the ground with people uh, trained in a um, field capacity, you know, right one-on-one, -on -one, uh, learning by doing and working with those that are more advanced. Uh, we do think that it's important to have a classroom setting for some very specific hard skills that need to be done. Um, but a lot of people in the union world are predominantly in commercial spaces. Uh, it often pays better to do commercial work. And so residential one is, is a great opportunity for people to grow into uh, a career with benefits that's often not found in the residential world. But we do believe that a hiring hall model that is used in uh, union world where, um, you know, I as a contractor can call the union and say, I need X number of workers with certain skill sets. And uh, the union's job is to help ensure that we have them provided we agree to certain wages, benefits and standards. Uh, that's not yet happening with Let Abatement, but it is something that we have been exploring and, and trying to figure out how to plan around. Because as this work is unfolding, we need more people with very specific skills that it's often hard to find. Uh, and so 
we work directly on the ground, but we want to explore how to, to train people more in preparation. So as more and more communities are thinking to do, especially the lead paint abatement, just to be clear, I know we've been talking about pipes as well, but uh, lead paint abatement, um, we believe that the way to do this is to know the kind of work that's coming, prepare for the work that's needed, like drywalling, window replacement, bending aluminum trim to, to wrap around uh, different surfaces that have lead paint on it, scraping paint, cleaning up, making sure workers are ready to do it and that they're ready to go at a moment's notice. Because when homeowners are taken out of the house, that's not a lot of time to be training people at that moment on how to do it when there's generally 10 days that the homeowners are out of the house. And so more and more, we want to prepare with folks like uh, workforce development agencies, uh, laborers union, other unions, and uh, community organizations that prepare. However, the main thing is the infrastructure still needs to be built. Uh, there's a lot of work coming, but it's also been a lot of waiting in some areas. And so we want to you know, prepare for how uh, to get more workers to do it because there's a lot to do. Thanks for your insight on that piece, Kevin. Um, Alicia, let's go to you. How have you integrated job training into your coalition model? So Junction Coalition realizes that as the infrastructure ages, so does the workforce. So we focus a lot on young people, 14 to 24, in partnering with the different trades um, to take on a home and actually model what the en engagement looks like. Um, we have purchased homes and worked directly with Carpenters Union and worked with um, some public utility partners to teach how to test for lead lines. If the pipe is galvanized, copper, or lead, knowing how to detect that via the identification with the magnet in the scratch test. We've also worked with the older group from 18 up in regards to making sure that one, you have certifications for lead abatement. You have a lot of tests that you have to pass. So giving them those skill sets and working with the Department of Neighborhoods and our mayor's office to ensure that community can get into those testing areas and work to understand what's happening. In the meantime, making sure that if there are individuals such as retired plumbers, retired vets, and people that are trusted in the community, trust is everything. You have to be able to knock on doors. Folks have to know who you are. So speaking with the police department and saying we're going to be in a particular neighborhood, making sure we have signage to tell folks what to look for, such as badges, a same color shirt. Our shirts actually read got lit. And then we go into the home and test, um, whether it be making sure people understand, you know, the dust test. You know, what are you talking about? How do you do that? What does that mean? And where do I send it thereafter? So creating citizen science and building community participatory action helps to build trust in the community and awareness in the community and also helps us all to create a pathway for a livable wage with workforce development for our children. So you're working with the multi-level of generations, uh, cultures, and making sure that we have language that can be translated in those homes, as well as being culturally competent and responsive as we go into those homes. When we are preparing our QR codes for, that you can scan and learn how to put on a water filter, how to do a dust test, all of those things, they have to be multi-language. You have to have bilingual opportunities for those individuals, as well as have ADD compliance. So all of those things are important to make sure that people feel comfortable enough to say, this is what I don't know, this is what I need to know, and how can I get more information? And we have to understand there is a digital divide. So you can't put everything on the internet. You have to get out. You have to knock the doors. You have to go into, we're going to have a trunk or treat Sunday. Lead information will be at that trunk or treat. Books will be at that trunk or treat. We ordered books from Deanna and those books will be at that trunk or treat. So it is building not only a coalition within Toledo, but building a universal coalition throughout the nation that we're all speaking the same language, that we're all hearing the stories of those that have been harmed and that we're elevating those stories through love, work and commitment. 
Such powerful remarks. Thank you for that, Alicia. And I, I just completely agree with you that we need a nationwide coalition. I want to shout out my colleague, uh, Melly Garcia, Melissa Garcia from the Ecology Center in Grand Rapids. You know, I know the Glenn Network, the Great Lakes Lead Elimination Network has been doing some great work to convene uh, different, different coalitions uh, working in the city. So huge shout out to Melly and, and the Glenn Network. All right. Um, our next question uh, for our panelists is, uh, what factor helped you drive your biggest success and, and how did that fall into place for you? Um, let's, go to, let's go to Deanna to kick things off for this question. I think that our top three successes have been, um, number one was securing the 31 million in ARPA dollars to fund our health department to respond to more lead cases, working with the city eco office to give homes that are getting lead abatement additional resources to get their homes weatherized and save money and energy bills. We also managed to support our workforce investment board to train lead abatement workers. So as more lead abatement work becomes available from contractors like Kevin, he has some workers to offer apprenticeship opportunities too. Another success of ours has been the ability to work with directly impacted families and seeing parents get active. It's just, it's just been amazing. And another, and probably the biggest success for me was creating the Life Free Superhero book to help spread awareness, help the church, help me get the book published and the Coalition on Lead Emergency helped me to voice to use my voice to become a pillar in the community and capture the attention of the Vice President of the United States. I had the honor of bringing my sons along with me to present her with the first published copy of Aiden, the Left for Superhero book at the White House Lead Pipe Summit this year. And I was invited back to the State of the Union address where the Vice President's office delivered a copy of my book to the Library of Congress. But most importantly, my goal is to continue to reach more parents and children affected by lead so that no one has to go through what Eddie and I went through alone. There is strength in numbers. And as a team, we will keep fighting until the day that lead is eradicated, not just in the city of Milwaukee, but worldwide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Deanna. And for our audience, can you just um, give them a brief description of the book? What's in Le Aiden the Lead Free Superhero? Aiden the Lead Free Superhero book is the story of what Aiden went through when he was hospitalized twice for his lead poisoning. The book is completely illustrated by Aiden. I uh, you, I wrote the words, but it's all Aiden's story. It's a children's book that makes every child who has been faced with lead feel like a superhero and let them know that um, even though they are lead poisoned, they can defeat the lead monster and they are superheroes in their own right, and they can do their part to fight the lead monster and become superheroes. And there's also information in the back of the book for parents who just recently found out that their child is lead poisoned, and they're feeling like they're not getting the help and resources that I wish I had. There's resources and help in the book for parents as well. Thank you for that, Deanna. All right, uh, next panelist, what factor helped drive your biggest success and how did this fall into place for you? Let's go to Kevin. So um, the factors that kind of fi figured all this is, is we were uh, quite excited to, to prepare for what's coming with things like the Inflation Reduction Act and other areas where energy efficiency is gonna become a much bigger issue. Uh, what uh, was kind of a, a disappointment though is that uh, some of those funds are not expected to come until uh, a little, down the line. And so in, in kind of preparing with coalition partners, one of the other things that the Coalition on Lead Emergency helped make possible is that the city of Milwaukee has uh, pushed to make sure that um, they want to do lead and energy efficiency combined. And that sort of combined vision of can we make houses safe and healthy and green uh, is one that uh, was a, was an interesting challenge, but also a good opportunity because we see it all the time. And as we like to to say, like, we can't not see lead in all these houses that we work in. Uh, and so we wanted to take workers that had no experience in lead abatement uh, 
and in some cases in, in some carpentry portions and be able to get them to the point where they can can work on this. They're not just lead licensed, but they're capable and competent and excel and making homes uh, more involved. Our union friends, some of them had lead renovation, which is the the kind of lead, lead work you do without um, getting to that full abatement world um, on their training books, but they really weren't training people in some of these areas, we've met with a number of partners uh, in different unions here in the greater Milwaukee area. Uh, and so we're pretty excited to be able to say we want to get workers to maybe came from a different world outside of lead, such as energy efficiency, and integrate it into the work that uh, we're aiming to do. So whether we're doing official federal funded lead abatement projects, or whether we're just replacing windows and sealing air leaks uh, in homes with the other things that we do, we want to do that now in a lead safe manner so that we're able to leverage far more than just what is dedicated to things like lead abatement, um, but to really live our vision, which is to create good living wage union jobs, uh, ideally for people from the community, in the very communities that they're going to work in. And so, and making sure that those workers who work in hazardous conditions, uh, such as lead paint, have access to to good living, good uh, family covering insurance. We don't want to take any of this uh, lead paint home, back into our offices, or any of the rest of that stuff. We don't want to make it worse. We want to make it better. So it has been a kind of a bumpy path. I won't lie. The city of Milwaukee hasn't yet started the energy side of the lead and energy work, uh, but we're excited to be coalition partners with coal. And um, I know that we're going to continue doing our work lead safe and uh, participate as much as possible in the lead abatement work. Yeah, thank you for that, Kevin. And, and you know, I often say that Green Homeowners United just really is an anomaly because there aren't many union contractors in the residential space. Um, Kevin, could you talk a little bit about the importance of your your business model and, and why offering things like prevailing wage is, is important for your workers? Sure. So residential work is very different than commercial. It's predominantly non-union. It's a lot of very small companies that often are just trying to figure out how to make it uh, day to day. The, your average residential company has four workers, including the owner oftentimes, and less than only about 3% of residential construction firms have more than 20 employees. And so by definition, it is often a small uh, world uh, of trying to figure out how to make homes better. That's difficult for agencies and organizations and coalitions trying to figure out how to create good jobs, safe homes, fight climate change. Uh, and so in working with a number of partners to, to improve on the wages and benefits, uh, to lift the floor up, so to speak, uh, we can try to make these programs lives easier, but also making sure that the end result are people being paid uh, good wages. What we would hate is that, for example, with, with what coal has done to help bring in millions of dollars in the lead abatement, we would hate that if people did this as gigs, and then afterwards they were done and did other things. We want people to see these as careers and launching points uh, so that they stay in this craft for decades to come. We don't have an option. There is far too much to do. We need master insulators. We need master lead abaters and window installers. Um, the only way that happens is good uh, family supporting wages and benefits so that people can safely and economically stay in this field. And so working with partners uh, makes that possible, but we also want to lift the floor on the process to make sure that it's truly competitive and affordable. Thank you for that, Kevin. Yeah, good paying union jobs to keep kids safe from, from lead. I think that sums it up pretty sufficiently. Um, next, we have Miss Alicia Smith. So, Miss Alicia Smith, can you share with us what factor helped drive your biggest success, and how did this fall into place for you? I'll be honest. Um, as I stated when we first started, self-interest. I'm the proud grandmommy of a five-year-old beautiful girl, Elise, and immediately having her tested, making sure that even before she was with us and her, while she, her mom was still with child, making sure we had the necessary tests done in the home, um, testing the soil, you know, making sure that the dust was even, you know, changing the windows. But during that process, you're uh, in disrupt, disrupting everything and dust goes out into the air. So it becomes airborne. So making sure that um, our community was aware. Uh, it was nothing about us without us. The community has to know what is being done to them in order for them to be able to trust 
us to come into their space. Um, making sure, I, I think it was one of our young men that we had with the juvenile court. And he says, Miss Alicia, we know you love us, but that doesn't feed us. And that is something that is so paramount. We have to create the jobs. If this is a need, and we know that it is, this there is a public health sector that many of our young people can get involved in to help to service their families. This work has to become part of our everyday language, everyday practice. And that is what we have done. And it has caused us to understand that our community is the laboratory where we teach, where we provide services, and where we work and receive pay to begin to create an economic engine for a better quality of life. So for us, it was each and every parent that had a child, we could go in and we could talk from that perspective. You know, um, clinical homes with the public health institutions, academic institutions that could tell us what is the connection, the correlation between lead cognitive disabilities in the juvenile court system. And the suspension rate, there is a direct correlate, correlation. And so th those were the things, building trust and voice, community participatory action, making sure that the community is present because no one's going to buy in if we don't buy in, right? Um, and then everyone you know, needs to be part of this process. It needs to be the most important thing that folks understand that there is zero amount of lead that is safe for human consumption. And we say zero to six, but anyone, no one should be consuming lead from your pipes and making sure that you have a filter. Think about how many people that cannot install a filter, that pictures don't fit in the refrigerators. So we were fortunate to have the federal EPA come into Junction and actually create a research engine of how do we communicate around lead and water. And that is another area that making sure people understand that lead is something of, that is not just a contaminant in soil and dust, but in our pipes and our water, something that we need every day. And so I think that our greatest success was making this an engine of education, connecting it to workforce development, and then creating an opportunity and engine for people to have living wage jobs and working with our unions who many times are trusted individuals in our community, as well as our veteran, retired veterans. Lisa, thank you so much for that and very impressive work coming out of Junction. Um, could you share a little bit more about the success you've had in partnering with your water utility and really stressing cultural competency and getting in these homes and removing these pipes? Oh my goodness. I think Ed Moore is somewhere like, oh my God, I could strangle her. But the beautiful thing about talking with our public utility was making sure that they understood not everyone was getting the information. There are people who are more concerned about getting their families fed and paying their bills than going to a meeting at city council and can't make that time. And Ed was kind enough to make some of those meetings available to a community during the weekends. You know, um, I can recall a time where I was in Chicago and there I got a call from a lady that says, I don't know what kind of pipes I got. I don't, I don't know if I've got alkaline and I don't know if I've got. And I said, hold on, wait a minute. Let me get someone from the public utility on the phone. And thankfully, our mayor was able to have a, a 936-2020 engage Toledo where folks could call at any time and get their questions answered. Think about it. You put something in a purpose, public service announcement that says, protect your family against lead. And then you got folks knocking on your door wanting to come in and test your lead lines. That's one, it instills that this is important, but it also instills fear if you can't answer questions, if you can't get your answers, your questions answered. So thankfully our public utility partnered with us. We did a public service announcement. We were able to have an event called um, For the Love of Water, where we brought together over 8,000 people into the park and just educated them about their issues around lead. And we used R&B music to get mostly young people in that park. And you know, if young people talk about it, everybody's going to talk about it. We did that in partnership with Black environmental leaders to make sure that this was a universal call. 
And we had folks from everywhere. And it was just a wonderful ha occurrence. So our public utility has opened up. It was more so, Ed said to me, he said, Alicia, I see the public utility work as a social commitment to make sure that people are safe. It's not just getting water to homes, but it's getting safe, affordable drinking water to homes. So I'm very thankful for the partnership. Such crucial work. And thank you for all your hard work in protecting children, Alicia. And communities, because as you said, it's not only a youth issue, it's an issue for, for all people. So definitely. All right. Well, um, we do have one last question before we open it up to our audience to see if they would uh, like to ask our panelists any question. And this question is, what's one pearl you'd like to share with our audience today? Let's start with you, Deanna. I want to share that um, A.N.'s highest lead level when he was hospitalized the second time was 50 micrograms per deciliter. And his lead level today, he's um, 10 now. He was lead poison at 2. He's down to 6.5 now. And he is just, he is so amazing. He is doing so well at school. I have a five-month-old daughter now that's lead free. And that's because of all the work I've been doing with Cole and help with the and because of the next door pediatrics, Dr. Lisa, this is just a lot of effort um, from a lot of amazing people that made this happen. Um, for me to have a lead free child and to have children who are impacted by lead that are thriving and doing well. So that's that's what I want to share. That that that's why um, the coalition is here and that's why it's, it's doing well because of stories like this that I can share. That is a beautiful pearl, Deanna. Thank you for sharing that out. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that Aiden is performing well in school. So that is that is wonderful. All right, um, next we'll go to Miss Alicia Smith. What's one pearl you'd like to share with our audience today? I, I first want to say I need Deanna to stop making me cry every time we're on the screen together. <laughs> but it, there's tear, there are tears of joy, I think, one pearl that just recently was announced on Monday is we will continue this work and the work is being sponsored and supported by the Center for Disease Control, who understands and sees the need for elevating the education around reducing and preventing lead exposure in communities. And so Junction was awarded 600000 over three years to get the information out by way of building on coalitions and collaborations. So thank you to Healthy Babies, Bright Futures and to Cole for inviting us to this conversation and to lift up this issue. Um, I also wanna say that on Monday, Congresswoman Captor, Senator Paula Hitz Hudson and all of our local partners understand that this is going to be a federal, state and local, a national need and they were all present. So the collaboration has already happened. Indiana is teaching us all that if you don't have parents who have been impacted in that coalition, then it isn't a true coalition for our communities. And so we're already having conversations with daycares, with um, within the churches, within the communities, and want to lift those stories in a respectful way, because the community is the expert. They are the ones living in the harm, and we are thankful to have these funds to ensure that we can reduce and prevent this harm moving forward. Thanks for that, Alicia. Um, lastly, we have Mr. Kevin Kane. What, what's one pearl you want to share with our audience, Kevin? So what I'm kind of excited by is that all this attention on addressing lead paint especially uh, has really encouraged a lot of private action too. Uh, all the federal dollars that will go toward lead abatement will predominantly, understandably, go to those that are maybe most at risk and most unable or least able, I should say, to handle the financial impact of it. These projects can be often north of $30,000, and we have seen projects that cost more than the house is valued sometimes. Now, that's a, a 
bad situation in, in certain homes, but at the same time, it's also compelled a lot of people who privately are concerned about they and their family's health to want to step up and take action uh, to pay themselves for window replacement, not for energy efficiency purposes alone and not for comfort purposes alone, but to protect their chil children and themselves. And we have had people approach us saying, I want private, I want to privately pay to, to cover this. And this is helping to unlock lots of opportunities there's there's a, a sense that it's in the air it's in the community it's in people's minds that we should address this now and that's wonderful because while today someone who may not be eligible for these federal programs might live in that house in the future someone else who can't afford to pay it themselves uh, may live in that house and luckily this might be addressed if it's through private needs in some cases so they're bringing in more money on top of that and where possible we want to loop it in with other funding sources tax credits rebates fair financing but what's exciting again is that more and more people are seeing this in the news and they think I should act too in my own home. Thank you for that, Kevin. It's a great insight. Well, that concludes our panel and, and what we have uh, designed is prompts to, to kind of spur some of the conversation. Um, next, I wanna open it up to our audience uh, to ask some questions. And we have one for you, Kevin, already from Ms. Janet Pritchard. Uh, the question reads, Kevin, if you are using funds from the Inflation Reduction Act or other public funds for residential energy efficiency work, and you are doing a job that includes sealing or replacing windows, prompted initially by energy efficiency concerns, um, and you find that there are lead hazards uh, and lead paint on those windows, can you roll costs the lead abatement work into the energy efficiency costs covered by public funds? Because to safely address the energy efficiency, you need also to abate the lead. So that's an awesome question. And in some ways, yes. In other ways, not as much. And uh, so we've really kind of gone deep down this, this uh, rabbit hole to figure that out. Um, Usually when we're trying to make a home more energy efficient, lead paint is not a huge reason why we can't. Other issues are going to be things like asbestos, vermiculites, other things that can kind of more easily get into the air and, and cause problems. For example, uh, and Janet, I know you know this well, when there is uh, asbestos in a home, we can't run the blower door device to measure how leaky a house is. Lead paint is, is less of a concern on that front. Uh, the big areas where there is overlap that we have found is on windows and doors. Uh, as friction surfaces that often make lead paint more likely. And then also basement walls. A lot of people ended up painting their basement walls uh, with a lead-based paint. And then over time, that that starts to, because uh, of the moisture that goes through porous concrete can, can crack and cause problems. The solution to that is also the energy efficient solution in covering the walls with a rigid material that is dust and airtight that could also be insulation. We have put rigid insulation that is sealed against basement walls that both make the house warmer and block lead paint surfaces uh, and moisture and, and other concerns on that front. So there's a nice synergy. But to your question about uh, paying for it, uh, in some cases, yes. So in that example about the basement walls, uh, we that can help unlock rebates or will soon from the Inflation Reduction Act that can... Uh, make it more affordable to do that kind of project. For windows, there's less rebates for windows, but there will be federal tax credits that people can access right now for triple pane windows. And so as people are considering, hey, I wanna upgrade my windows either for energy or lead purposes, they can unlock these other things. The extra cost of doing a window lead safe versus just replacing that window, it's not high. It's really how it should be done no matter what. Too many don't, but... Uh, Role integrating that into the process is really not that hard or that much more expensive. Um, the one thing, though, that is really helpful as the private market for this starts to grow is less about rebates and more about fair financing. So, for example, the city of Milwaukee has an energy efficiency financing program through Summit Credit Union that the city set up. A lot of that is for energy efficiency improvements, such as window replacements. We have used that as a way to say, let's upgrade someone's windows in a lead safe manner that also saves them energy. That wasn't designed as a lead program, but it's an energy financing program that helps with lead as well. The last thing I'll say is that the ARPA dollars that uh, here in Milwaukee are being spent on lead abatement cannot be integrated with the Inflation Reduction Act rebates. They cannot. Uh, there are rules against integrating the two. However, Milwaukee has integrated ARPA dollars for energy and ARPA dollars for lead together, or at least that's the plan they haven't started yet. Um, but we can't combine the two with Inflation Reduction Act rebates in that way. We can use other funding like the Inflation Reduction Act funds to upgrade houses uh, 
We just don't necessarily get lead abatement dollars with that. Got it. Thank you for that, Kevin. All right. We got a bunch of good questions coming in. I'm going to try to get through all these in the order that they came in. All right. So first one is from uh, Jean Marie. Uh, since she is working with the CHPAC, do you know what that acronym stands for, Kira? Kyra? CHPAC? I'll get that. I'll put it out in the chat to everybody. Okay. Great. Um, she asked, what should the EPA do to improve their policies, actions, and communication on lead? Uh, Alicia, let's start with you. Public relations, communication, and community activation. Those things have to happen. The EPA, as I shared, came to Junction was in the community. So folks were able to ask, ask questions. We were able to run some of those um, public service announcements. We had questions when to boil the water. So making sure that we are clear on what folks should do to prevent con further contamination or what they can do to prevent the contamination. Also, working with the public utilities, making sure you understand what's going on. We, after inspecting and identifying lead pipes, the city, we get that information to the city and the city goes out and replace those lead lines to the customer at no cost. So constantly having transparency and communication so that the community itself knows what to do. I would say that is the best course of action that what we've had success with. Thanks for that, Alicia. Um, and then Jean Marie, in terms of you know other things that EPA can do to improve their policies or improve their just overall communications in the communities, I think um, being able to work with utilities directly to solve some of their issues is is a, a smart move because oftentimes uh, states are limited in their ability to offer technical assistance to different utilities or even relationship build with utilities to learn the totality of, of issues. Um, I also think that in terms of coordination around lead work, the EPA should uh, better work with HUD. And you know, while we have lead poisoning cases identified and HUD funded properties or HUD funding lead poisoning responses, um, we need to replace lead service lines while we got those landlords on the phone. You know, uh, oftentimes signing off uh, allowing the, the the contractor to enter into the home is, is the biggest problem. And if we have a lead poisoning case at a resident and the, the landlord is on board, you know, let's get that landlord to, to, to sign a waiver to get their lead service line replaced. So better integration between what they do to replace lead service line and, and HUD to uh, abate homes. All right, uh, back to the Q&A. Uh, Ms. Kathleen Ross asked, can you speak to testing rates? Are most providers testing children at 12 and 24 months of age? Do you have any suggestions on how to engage providers? We are struggling to get our providers to test. Thank you. Deanna, do you have any insight from Ms. Kathleen Ross about testing? Oh, that's a subject because at Cold Parents Lead, that's a... Um, a question, a concern that most parents have because they feel like um, when they're asking for the test and I feel like um, most pediatricians, I'm not sure why they're not testing, but um, the parents have to ask for the tests. And when they do, um, they begin some static about um, the pediatricians not testing. Um, I know um, it's just, it's just, this has been a lot. And that's the reason why this is just a very emotional topic because we need more pediatricians like Dr. Lisa that are active and willing to test and make sure the kids are being tested. And they are trying to close down next door pediatrics now. And that's really one of the clinics that I refer all my parents to when they come to me and say that their pediatrician is not listening to them. It's not testing their kids. I say, go to next door pediatrics, go Dr. Lisa, she will help you. And now they're trying to close that clinic down. And I'm fighting hard to keep that clinic in our community for our children. More than half of the children and parents in the neighborhood have to walk to the clinic. So closing that clinic down is going to hurt a lot of families. And I just can't let that happen. So um, 
I'm sorry to get off the topic, but this is just very frustrating because there I have a walk organizing on Saturday to prevent this from happening. So we need more um testing done. I'm not sure why pediatricians aren't doing it, but um Dr. Lisa and other great pediatricians like her have been willing to work with coal, have been willing to come to cooking with coal classes and test kids on the spot for lead. It's just so much she is doing for the community. And we need more pediatricians like her to step up. And that's what I want to see. Yeah, great points, Deanna. And just to kind of touch on that a little bit more, Kathleen, um, you know, Medicaid children are supposed to be tested at least three times before the age of three. And unfortunately, you know, many providers, as, as you have stated, are, are not testing, uh, doing venous draws. Um, one thing that I have seen groups advocate for are uh, community testing programs like what COLA Safe and Healthy Homes Project is doing so that uh, a capillary test can happen at someone's residence. And then being able to uh, build a relationship between that outreach program and a hospital system so that um, while outreach workers are doing capillary testing on the doors, if they find something, they can adequately uh, refer someone to a medical home, much like Alicia alluded to earlier. So yeah, great, great question. Um, I also know that the Medicaid reimbursement for lead testing is not that much. And uh, oftentimes providers shy away from initiating lead screenings because of uh, how they are reimbursed by the federal government. So um, that's a, another topic of discussion. I think we could do a whole webinar on just testing. So great question, Kathleen. Um, we got four minutes left. I'm going to try to get through uh, these two questions. The next question is from um, Miss Heather Binder. Uh, what were the most successful steps in establishing or recruiting a pipeline for low-income workers to achieve fair wages and, and union trade careers? Uh, Kevin, let's go to you for that one. Well, we're still kind of working on some of that because uh, we're taking people who are learning how to do lead abatement and it's a, no, it's a slow process of, of, of doing it. There's a lot of different skills that you often don't find in uh, one training program. For example, window replacement is common. Installing drywall uh, is common, often different type of careers. Uh, using an aluminum brake to bend metal around window trim soffits fascia that's often like siding work or, or roofing work uh, as well as a uh, proper cleanup and uh, plastic sheeting and, and general carpentry so you have things like carp work that's often ascribed to carpenters laborers cleaning experts siding people uh all, you know all these different areas uh and so it's a it's a process for sure um but what we've found is is possibly promising is that Instead of trying to get one company to do all of those, in which case that's pretty much all they're going to do, uh, what you can also do is try to get coalitions and partners of multiple contractors who are prepared to help each other with their particular specialty and be available under these somewhat strict guidelines. And so we might have a drywalling expert because my team doesn't do as much drywall, things like that. Uh, and so that's one area that we see is helping the smaller contractors who may not be able to float a quarter of a million dollars in payments they haven't gotten yet for work they've already done to handle this and, and, and do it with partners. Alicia, could you touch on that question? Uh, what were the most successful steps in establishing or recruiting a pipeline for low-income workers to achieve union jobs? The most successful step was creating a pre-apprenticeship or a community exposure process because of, as Kevin said, it's a slow process. And then actually having ARPA funds allocated to act, actually activate the young people. So taking, you know, and giving young people $10, $10 an hour, adults in the community $20 an hour so that they could learn the process, learning how to do it. There's an entire testing for the state of Ohio that you have to go through, but you have to be able to give people something that they feel you're vested in them and will go through the process of training, educating, and then going out into practice. So we use some of our ARPA funds to be able to give them dollars just to train, right? And then for some of the plumbers and other contractors who 
were coming as part of the training process, it was rewarding to see some of those young people go into apprenticeships. So from training to mentorship to apprenticeship, and that's, you know, it's rewarding for everyone at that point. But we definitely used ARPA funds and other um, delinquents tax information and, and support to make sure that there was a pot of money to pay folks. Thank you for that, Alicia. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion with these great Midwest leaders. And we are hopeful for more action to protect children from childhood lead poisoning over the coming years, months, and days. All right, everyone. We'll have a great rest of your day and take care. <laughs>